church family. It's good to be with you on your screen today and I uh, trust that you had a great Mother's Day weekend last weekend. What a wonderful week of weather we've been enjoying this week and uh, before we get into uh, God's Word this morning, um, just want to let you know that as we wrap up this morning's message, we're going to be participating in a time of communion uh, for you or for your family. And so if you'd like to participate in that, uh, you can just make your way, if you haven't already, to get uh, juice and, and uh, bread or crackers, something like that, that you can uh, uh, participate uh, with me and with your church family today in a time of remembrance and a time of rededication of our lives and our faith to the Lord Jesus. So with that, we're going to pray and then we'll get into God's word this morning. Father, we thank you for uh, the provision from heaven to earth, from you to us. We thank you, Lord, for the price that Jesus was willing to pay on a cross that uh, he didn't deserve. But in doing so, he brought, um, he brought life and he brought uh, together what was torn apart by sin. And so, Jesus, as we cling to that today, as we remember that and in faith uh, live our lives forever saying thank you to, to you for what you've done on the cross, we, we dedicate this time and this space, Lord, for you to speak into our lives. Holy Spirit, would you um, just walk and work in our lives? In Jesus' name, amen. So <clears throat> before we get into kind of what is going to be our main text uh, for this morning, I want us to take a, uh, a moment and when the Holy Spirit comes upon the believers on the day of Pentecost and when uh, the Holy Spirit fills them and, and births the church, really, it's the birthing of the church, we, we see that um, God has been setting in motion things uh, even before setting the stage by telling the disciples it's better that I go because if I go then somebody else the advocate the the counselor the spirit of truth the Holy Spirit of God is going to come and he's going to fill you and he's going to be with you wherever you go and greater things will you do in my name because of it. So with that in mind, we, we see in the book of Acts, in the beginnings of the book of Acts, that event, that historical event, and the birthing of the church. And I want to just share <clears throat> from the Word of God this morning in that book of Acts. And this is Peter's sermon that he begins to speak right after uh, the events unfold and he is emboldened. It's like a brand new Peter, a guy with probably a strong Galilean 
uh, accent that would give away maybe where he's from and it just seemed like an unlikely place as they were kind of talking about you know who Peter was and where he came from even in the midst of his sermon but but he uh, shares this message a simple message that just is outlying Jesus and what he's done for them and uh, and 3,000 people are added to the church that very day they baptize uh, 3,000 believers and you know just you just think about that I mean uh, think of all, all that would have needed to take place in in now bringing them up in the faith and bringing them up in the Lord discipling them what a wonderful and and daunting task that was but the Holy Spirit was with them and he was growing the church daily daily growing the church so may he grow our lives Acts chapter 2 verses 22 through to 36 this is just in the midst of Peter's message and so this is what he's saying fellow Israelites he begins listen to this Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. I love how, how Peter phrases that. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, Peter goes on, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch, patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on, this, on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear for david did not ascend to heaven and yet he said the lord said to my lord sit at my right hand until i make your enemies a footstool for your feet therefore let all israel be assured of this god has made this jesus whom you crucified both lord and messiah i love love how peter filled with the Holy Spirit, just in such a powerful way, you know, speaks of David's declaration. And, you know, most of the Jews probably thought David was speaking somehow about himself, but he, he you know, recognized that David was just speaking prophecy about the one who was to come, the Messiah, Jesus, who was just crucified days, you know, earlier, is now Lord. And Messiah. So let's back up a little bit. So John chapter 17 that we've been going through, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus spending time praying for himself and praying for those his closest friends, the disciples, and then praying for you and me, praying for all who would believe. That was, I want you to think about this, that was the last time that Jesus was going to be speaking with those friends of his until the other side of the resurrection, until after the events of the resurrection. And with all the events that 
are surrounding the next chapters. The events surrounding Jesus' arrest, uh, around the trial, around his crucifixion in chapters 18 and 19. John, disciple of Jesus, one of his closest friends and writer of this gospel, in telling us the good news of Jesus, John was centered on retelling these events with a certain focused narrative in mind, I, I believe. Uh, John's first focused in, in these next verses, you know, in, in chapters 19 and 20, uh, first off, is that everything Jesus did and everything that Jesus said until his last breath was calculated, was something that had been thought through, was something that was God working in the midst of all the chaos of those events, fulfilling prophecy about the Messiah, his anointed one, the King of Israel, Jesus. And we see this in, in verses 36 and 37 of chapter 19. John declares this. He says, these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. This is just the moments uh, right after the crucifixion, the, the moments when the Roman soldiers were coming up to Jesus and checking to see if he was dead. And, and in fact, he was already dead and they pierced his side. And those events, it says, these things happen in verses 36 and 37, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one that they have pierced. So just like Matthew, when Matthew is telling the events uh, of the good news of Jesus, and he's writing to a Jewish audience, and so he's captivated by, by the, the thought for the Jewish mind that Jesus all along, all that he was doing, all that he was saying, he was fulfilling Jewish scripture that they were thinking was going to be of the coming Messiah. Jesus was fulfilling it in their very hearing. And John is kind of taking that as, as well and saying, you know what, the things that Jesus was saying, the things that Jesus did, we're seeing that scripture is being fulfilled. Psalm 34 talking about this. Uh, Zechariah, we'll, we'll uh, dig up those a little bit later. So everything Jesus did, everything he said, was, was seen now as Jesus fulfilling prophecy about the coming Messiah. Another focus, main focus that John has in, in these um, chapters here, and the events of Jesus' death and then his resurrection, Make no mistake, he was writing to make sure that everyone understood that Jesus was 100% fully, totally dead. That there's no question of the events of the crucifixion, whether he was dead uh, or not. There was, there's no need to question that because everything that was done was speaking to the fact that Jesus was 100% fully dead. And first first thing that just jumps out at me is is when Jesus um, when John says that Jesus gave up his spirit in John chapter 19 verse 30 it says when he had received the drink that he was given Jesus said it is finished it is accomplished it is completed it is fulfilled it is finished he says and with that John writes he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Remember Jesus talking before with, um, with people saying that no man takes his life from him, that he is the one who will lay down his life, that there's um, no one that's going to accomplish that. He is going to accomplish that because that's his mission. That was his purpose, laying down that surrendered life, surrendering to the will of the Father, and now in the moment on the cross, we're told that just after Jesus says it's finished, he bowed his head and he surrendered his life. He gave up his spirit. Totally 100% dead. This, the next, very next scene is the soldiers coming. And the soldier's job at this point was to come along and 
observe the, uh, the victims, those that were executed in this faction of crucifixion, and they were to come and break the legs of those that were crucified if they weren't dead. If they uh, were still alive, breaking the legs um, would speed up the death process. And we're told in the way that John talks about it, it was uh, time for preparation time just before Sabbath was coming. And so uh, they didn't want any of the work that would be done in preparing Jesus' body, taking it down from the cross, any of those things to be violations of Jewish Sabbath laws regarding work and, and uh, you know, the things that would have needed to take place uh, in, in that. And so they came and as they went along and they uh, broke the, the legs of the two criminals that were beside on either side of Jesus, uh, speeding up their death. The testimony that came from the Roman soldiers themselves was that Jesus was already dead. There was no need when they got to Jesus to break his legs because Jesus had already died. And then it goes on to say that a Roman soldier who was you know part of that whole whole thing, as they observed that Jesus was all that already dead, they tested that theory by taking a sword, taking a spear, and actually pushing it, thrusting it into the side of Jesus. And we're told that a mixture of blood and water flowed. And that, that was kind of sh showing us the science of, of what happens after a body actually passes away, that there is this separation now of blood and water that flowed as Jesus' body was pierced. So the Romans, as they were viewing this event, they saw it as a confirmation that he is 100% totally dead already. The Jews, they witnessed it and they saw it as evidence of, again, the fulfillment of prophecy, uh, the prophecy that, that um, John spoke of from uh, Zechariah and also from David in the book of Psalms when it was talking about uh, about none of his bones being broken and they will look on the one that they have pierced. Even those events speaking to Jesus being the fulfillment of scripture about the coming Messiah. So um, <clears throat> then after after these events, we see Jesus is taken down from the cross and we see that he is put in a tomb. That Nicodemus, who was one of the uh, ruling Pharisees at the time, and this fellow that is just introduced here, Joseph of Arimathea, and we see that both of them are kind of secret believers. They, they believe that Jesus was who he said he was, but they had this fear of the people around them, the fear of man more than the fear of God, I think, was compelling them to kind of keep it in hushed tones, to keep it secretive, their belief in who Jesus was. And so it introduces them, it introduces Nicodemus again, along with Joseph of Arimathea, and they take Jesus' body and they take it to a tomb of Joseph's and they embalm Jesus' body in the Jewish fashion of the time. And then we see the events of chapter 20. And I know that we've already gone through the, uh, the Easter season, the Easter celebration, but let's once again kind of just try and wrap our minds around some of these things in, as John speaks in chapter 20 about all the evidences now. Yes, we know that Jesus was 100% truly uh, inequivocably dead and buried in a tomb. And now chapter 20 is about all the evidences that Jesus was 100% now fully alive three days later. So we see the events. We see Peter and John first. They, they are going and they, they see an empty tomb. They run inside and they see that, that you know, all there's there is the strips of linen. There's there's nothing, no body to be found. And they run and they run back to the place where the other disciples are and they start getting word and and in 
these you know things that are kind of going in fast motion now mary with others are uh, other women are going and they're uh, going to to see the place where jesus was laid for themselves and they miss peter and john in the in the rush and and jesus first appearance after his resurrection is to a woman i think that's that's significant in and of itself how jesus valued you know, women in a time when women weren't really seen as that valuable, but to Jesus, we're all valuable. He appears first to Mary, and Mary, you know, thinks that that he's a gardener, and and and, and uh, all the confusion that that goes on there, and she's just overcome when he speaks her name. I can't imagine what that would have been like for her. And she goes back and she goes back to, to tell and she, she tells fearful disciples. John pays special attention to say that as she goes back to the, the house, the, the doors are locked. The doors of the house are locked because they are fearful of the Jews. They know what just took place. They were there. They witnessed the events of their leader, Jesus, being publicly executed for no crimes and because of their association their close association they probably just figured they were next on the list and so they were in hiding and they were in fear and he appears to fearful disciples and he says peace peace and then as jesus is in the house you know he allows thomas to to work through his doubting you know the, Thomas talks and, and, and says to the other disciples, he says, unless I see the nail marks, you know, in his hands, unless I can put my hand and touch the, the piercing on his side, I will not believe all of this chatter that's going on, that Jesus wasn't there, that Jesus might be raised from the dead, that Jesus has appeared. And then as Jesus makes the appearance, I mean, aren't we glad Aren't we glad that John paid attention and took note of that special moment where Jesus meets Thomas exactly where Thomas was? He meets him in the midst of his doubts. He doesn't, you know, say, get through your doubts and then I'll show myself to you. No, he showed himself in the middle of Thomas's deepest fears and doubts. And it just reminds me that that's what Jesus will do for us. He can meet you. He can meet you today in the midst of whatever is going on in your life today. Whatever causes you to doubt. Whatever causes you to waver. Whatever causes you the, the deepest questions of life. He invites us in to those places. He, he says like he said to Thomas, come and, and see, you know. Look, touch, believe. I love in John uh, 14, which is, you know, much earlier, obviously, in verses 5 and 6, we're given this little glimpse of T Thomas, and Thomas says to, to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going when, when Jesus was talking about the fact that he was going to have to go somewhere, right? We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answers him, he says, I I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. This now, as Jesus appears to Thomas in the midst of his deepest doubts, is just a confirmation that that was really true, that Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And all that was promised of Messiah, even though they misunderstood in so many ways, you know, what Messiah was going to bring and what Messiah was going to do when he was on earth. Not understanding the events even yet of the crucifixion and on all the things of the resurrection. But Jesus is confirming to Thomas, I am the way and I am the truth. I am the life. Aren't we glad? Aren't we glad that Jesus meets us wherever we are in life? All the confusion, all the disappointment, 
wherever we are. And he invites us to come and to come and see and to come and learn that he is the answer to the deepest questions of life. In, uh, in John's Gospel, I love, I love how in chapter 20, verses 19 through 31, he, he brings this out. He says, so Jesus told him, because you have seen me, Thomas, and the rest, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believed. And yet believed. You know, that's, that's you and, and me. That's, that's maybe us who are gathered here listening to this this morning. Jesus says, if we put our faith and our trust in him, we are the believers. We are the believers. We are the convinced ones. We need no other proof. Like Mary, we have seen the Lord, she declared to the disciples. We've seen the Lord. And we need no, no other proof. We, like the disciples, yes, at times we're fearful. But like those disciples, Jesus has now spoken over us peace. Peace over our broken lies. Peace over our sin. Peace over our shame and our guilt. Peace over our doubts. And so we're the believers. We are the blessed. We're blessed because he was broken. We are blessed by God, by our Heavenly Father, because of the brokenness of Jesus. And like verse 31, 30 and 31, where John says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so we believe, we believe by faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We, we've received his life, light and life as as Jesus talked about, as John declared, that's what Jesus has brought to, to, to our lives. Light and life. And so our call, our, our call out to this generation, the one that we're living in present day, is the same call that Jesus said to Thomas. He says to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Friends, stop doubting and believe. Put your life's trust in the hands of Jesus, who loved you, who died for you, who by the power of God the Father raised this Jesus to life and offers you life in his name. This Jesus did all this for you and for me. He was betrayed, he was denied, he was arrested, he was tortured, he was executed on a cross, a criminal's cross. He was bruised and beaten, blood flowing down to cover over and to pay for my sin and your sin today. Won't you receive it? As we close our time this morning... Let's partake and participate in symbols that Jesus spoke of, of his body that was broken for us and his blood that was poured out for our forgiveness, for the ransom for many, all who would believe. And so as we take the bread or crackers, whatever you have, we take this. And as Jesus declared, as he blessed it and thanked the Lord for it and broke it, he said, this is my body. So this is a symbol of his body that we take today that was broken for you and for me.
And in the same way, Jesus, teaching his disciples, says, take this, this juice. It's my blood, the blood of the new covenant. And remember that my blood shed on the cross was to make a way for you to forgive your sin and to bring you into relationship with the Heavenly Father. And so we take this and we thank the Lord for his shed blood on the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Out of your love, you sent your one and only Son, Jesus, the Messiah, to come. Not just to, to teach us, not just to live as an example of how we can live, but ultimately to be the remedy for our sin and to bring us light and life. So Jesus, we thank you for your shed blood on the cross. We thank you for your broken body that brings healing and wholeness and forgiveness. And Lord, the rest of our lives, we want to live in a way of saying thank you. Holy Spirit, live life in and through us that we may more and more reflect the one who paid the ultimate price for our sin. So it's in Jesus' name that we thank you and ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Blessings on you today. to me
Jesus Christ.